number eight. Miss Opal, it's good to see you. I'm glad I got your chair back. <laughs> Let me tell y'all, that was about the most stressful that Tom's ever been. I borrowed her chair and then got COVID and, and then wanted to give it a week after we got out of quarantine before I started visiting our more mature saints. <laughs> Yeah, it. Uh, I thought Miss Opal was the sweetest lady in here. It, well, I was wrong. First Chronicles chapter number 16. Are you there? Read with me beginning at verse number 8. The Bible says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of Israel, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Remember his covenant forever. The word that he commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant that he made with Abraham. His sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute. To Israel as an everlasting covenant. Saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. When you were few in number of little account, and sojourners in it, wandering from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another people. He allowed no one to oppress them. He rebuked kings on their account, saying, Touch not my anointed ones, do my prophets no harm. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the people. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And he is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Now, that ought to sound a little bit familiar to you. Sounds an awfully like Psalm 96, which we read at the beginning of the service. It's because in this text, they are standing before the ark of God. In the Old Testament, that was a, a visible sign of the presence of God. It's where God met with his people. It's where the atonement happened. It's where sacrifices were offered. It's where God... And his people came together here at this ark. And so they're standing before the ark of God and they begin to sing. We live in a culture that is awfully strange. I had the privilege to go to the Ritz-Carlton in Naples, Florida. Now, Tom and Ritz-Carlton are not necessarily two things that kind of fit together. As a matter of fact, uh, 
uh, as a top performer in the company that I was working at, our, the owner of our company flew us down there. There was about six of us. And I remember one night, <laughs> he, by the way, he didn't like it when I showed up to the Ritz-Carlton in overalls either. So, But I remember one night we were sitting in a restaurant in the Ritz-Carlton, and that restaurant was adjoined to a, a bar. And I remember as we were sitting there eating, the song, Sweet Caroline, came over the speakers in the bar area. And not only did everybody in the bar area, but everybody in the restaurant, and I believe everybody in town, began to sing the song, Sweet Caroline. Y'all ain't that spiritual. Y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. We was riding down the road. Or, or I went to the, to the game the other night, and they've got this sign at the game that says, Hey, I just met you, and it may seem crazy, but buy a ticket and win the pork, maybe. What did it say? It said, hey, I just met you. Okay, I was close enough. Thank you for correcting me, though, because... <laughs> Because that little little piece of information really made this story different. <laughs> and, and, and I was reading the sign, and the senior that was sitting behind the table, I read it out loud because I was going to buy a ticket. And they said, I'm sorry, you're too old to get that reference. <laughs> and so I sung the song, hey, I just met you, and this is crazy. But here's my number. Call me, baby. Anyway, and I did it actually in tune. That was awful. But I I sung it to him, and it was good, too. It was better than Brother Ricky. Y'all wasn't there. Y'all don't know. But I I sung that song, and and they just kind of looked at me sideways. And I said, y'all realize that I have a 13-year-old daughter that piles people into my truck and we have to ride to Anadarko listening to Justin Bieber. I'm familiar with all of that stuff. I I know some of y'all were born saved. You never listened to any of that. But this is the thing. The culture around around us loves music. We was at the game and, and something came over the speakers and all of the kids were singing. Most of the adults were singing too. They were having a good time. Have you ever, I don't, it's, I know I don't need to ask this question, but it's one of them rhetorical ones. Have you ever watched a soccer game on TV? Most of us would say no. It's about like asking, you know, <laughs> you know what the wind is? Um, soccer games amaze me. And I'm going somewhere with this, so hang on. Soccer games amaze me. Because there will be thousands upon thousands of people in the stand singing. Watch the Tennessee Volunteers. And they'll sing Rocky Top. You can watch the Georgia Bulldogs, the greatest team on the face of the, of the planet. <laughs> they'll, they'll sing. They'll, the, the culture around us will sing. And many times as God's people who have more to sing about than anything else, we come to church and sit like bumps on a log. God's people have always been singing people. At the beginning of the year, or a a week after the beginning of the year, I started this series on Sunday nights of defining terms. We talked about the church. We actually started on a Wednesday night and talked about the Bible But then we talked about the church, what the church is. And then through the providence of God and preaching through John 4, we got to deal with worship last Sunday morning. Tonight I want to deal with this idea of singing. What it is, why we do it, all of those questions, just kind of break it down. I'm going to, I've only got like 14 or 15 points. But we're going to move through them quick, all right? We've got a long introduction and then a short 15 things to say. God's people 
have always sung. Always. In the Old Testament, they sung of salvation. In Exodus 15, they come across and Miriam and Moses struck up the band and they sung, Great is our Lord. He is a man of war because he swallowed the horse and the rider. They sung of victory in Judges 5. They sung of champions in 1 Samuel 18.7. They sung about deliverance in 2 Samuel 22. In our chapter that we read, they sung before the ark of God. They would sing in battle, 2 Chronicles 20.22. And they would sing in the temple, 2 Chronicles 29.28. But we we don't need to, to miss the fact that they sung. They, throughout the Old Testament, God's people were a singing people. Do you remember in the, I believe it's Psalm 84, either 87, where it says that they hung their harps on the willows. And they required of us a song. They said, sing us the Lord's song. Come on, sing us the Lord's song. Sing us one of them good songs that y'all been singing. What it was is they had a reputation when the, Jewish people came together. When the Hebrew people came together for worship and Passover, millions of them would lift their voice and sing and nations would actually come out to the edge of Jerusalem to hear the songs. God's people have always been a singing people. In the New Testament, Jesus sung, Matthew 28, 30. The apostles sung, Acts 16. They sung in prison. Churches were commanded to sing, Colossians 3.16. And as Revelation makes it clear all throughout, when we get to heaven, we will sing. One of the questions that we have to ask in looking at this subject is, what's so important about singing? What's so important about singing? How come we just can't chant? I mean, there's a bunch of a bunch of weirdos that chant. How come we just can't chant? How come we can't talk? What's what's so important about singing? Rob Smith said this. He said, "When we sing, we sing words with meanings. Those words not only facilitate the communication of context, but the singing of them helps communicate their." the emotional content as well. In other words, singing helps us engage the emotional dimensions of our humanity in a way that speaking doesn't. Music and words put together have a way of moving our hearts and minds in a way that mere words by themselves can't which is probably why we hear those songs at sporting events. It's an emotional time. Get pumped up. Singing gets the blood pumping. And spiritually speaking, singing gets the spiritual blood pumping. Uh, as, As excited as I am to have Brother Ricky with us, I need to make a confession. People like Brother Ricky get on my nerves. So does Brother Richard. Now, I've said it at his church. Them kind of folks get on my nerves. Brother Ricky's a great preacher. He'll be preaching for us while he's here as well. But Brother Richard and Brother Ricky, they can preach. And then they can play the guitar. And then they can go play the piano. And then they can go play the mandolin. People like that make me mad. And Brother Richard can't sing as good as Brother Ricky, but Brother Richard can sing halfway good. And God give all these people all these talents, and here I am, and y'all just got me. When you travel this, the, 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 the nation, when you travel preaching in different churches, you'll find out not every church can sing good. And at times we can't sing good. But man, I have preached behind some stuff that was rough. I would have sacrificed anything to have Brother Ricky with me. But I've also preached in places where the music was good. 
The singing was wonderful. Hearts were uplifted. And there is something about singing that gets the blood flowing to help us. Uh, one preacher said it like this. He said it's the music that helps get our hearts and minds in tune with God. And I actually agree with that. So why? Why do Christians sing? Why? Why? The Bible gives, um, the Bible gives more explicit answers to this, but there is two in particular that I want to focus in on tonight. The first one is found in Colossians 3.16. Look at this with me. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. This is, it's a command. It's, it's, a, it's, written, it's written in the imperative. He is telling us to do something. So, so why do we sing? Literally because he tells us to. Look at Ephesians 5, uh, 18 through 19. Verse 18 says, and, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Each of these passages address two things. The horizontal, or I'm sorry, horizontal aspect of singing. I'll get it right in a minute. The horizontal aspect of singing and the vertical aspect of singing. Horizontally, Christians address one another. He said, uh, in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another. He says in Ephesians 5.19, uh, addressing one another. Christians sing to each other. That's what scripture tells us. Preacher, I didn't come so that y'all can hear me sing. Well, rip these pages out of the Bible and completely ignore them. Singing is an opportunity to teach and admonish, to instruct and encourage one another through singing. That's the opportunity that he is talking. We affirm the truths of the gospel. Christians, um, Christians use this opportunity to encourage. When uh, I, I use I use a great example because Slim, he'll talk about it from now to the time he dies. We went to, to Tennessee, and we sat down. Of course, he's like a rock star walking through that church. I mean, I thought I, he was going to sign autographs or whatever. Okay, everybody had talked him up. Carlos and Brother Richard went back and talked about him like he was a rock star. So, I mean, they, they treated him like a rock star. But once the service got started and the church began to sing, that big old... Joker just melted. There's something about it. We sing to encourage one another. You say, well, I don't sound good. Sing anyway. It encourages me. I like hearing Jerry sing. I'm being so dead serious about this. All right, Jerry, I love you, but don't pick about my singing voice. But I love to hear him sing out. There's something that stirs on the inside of me. I was sitting up front, and for the first time in my life, I got to hear Bailey sing. She ain't going to do it very loud, and if I put a microphone, she's going to go home, all right? But I got to hear Bailey sing. And matter of fact, Bailey leaned up during I'll Fly Away and said, at my funeral, she said, make sure that we sing I'll Fly Away. There's something about singing to one another. Yes. You say, well, our, our, our singing isn't that great. We'll sing out. Sing out. Be the fat lighter that catches the rest of the stumps on fire. Let God use you to be a catalyst to spread. 
That's the horizontal aspect. However, there's also a vertical aspect because we ain't just singing to one another. If that's all it was, it would turn into a talent show. And matter of fact, Gloria would win unless Brother Ricky was here. Sorry, Miss Gloria. Sorry. But if that was the case, we would just hand out blue and red ribbons and a bunch of participation prizes because we live in a pansy generation. But we would just be talent showing. But that's not all there is to it. There is a vertical aspect. We are not simply singing to one another, but we are also singing to God. Even though we address one another, teach one another, admonish one another, we do so as we sing to God, making melody in our heart to the Lord. Singing is not just to others, but it's also to God. What are we actually doing when we sing? There's three things. All right? Calm down, Slim. There are three things. I'm still in the introduction. Don't say that. There are three major things that we do when we sing. We praise. This is probably the most obvious element of singing. However, it needs to be said. We are telling God and others what we love and admire about him. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. That's what we're doing. We are telling God and others how much we love and admire. We see that throughout the Psalms, but in Psalm 57 and also Psalm 46, you can go look at that later. But not just praise, but also prayer. Prayer. Whether we realize it or not, many of the psalms are prayers. I was talking to somebody this week who doesn't like praying publicly. And I respect that. I've had, I've had some of y'all tell me, preacher, don't you call on me to pray. And I'm fine with that. I'm not going to embarrass you. However, whether we realize it or not, we know how to pray Because we have the book of Psalms, which are public prayers. I I was telling Marion about about her children's class, and and I need to say this to you, so I'll just say it to you now. When when y'all teach, I love that you have the young kids, the teenagers, the members of your class pray. I, I think you ought to pray before Sunday school and after Sunday school. But I also think that as teachers, part of your responsibility is to also pray one of those prayers. Not because everything's about you. That's not it. It's because as a teacher, you are modeling how to pray. That's part of that. That was all free. That wasn't even in my notes. But prayer is a part of singing. Many songs, many psalms, many hymns are actually prayers. We see that. Psalm 55, Psalm 85, Psalm 83, Psalm 138, or even Psalms of Confession, Psalm 51. What did we sing this morning after the service? I surrender all. Now, that is a song, that is a hymn that is designed to speak to God. Singing is about praising, about praying. But it's also about proclamation. Songs can be used to teach. Think about Psalm 119. What does Psalm 119 talk about? Not you. What does Psalm 119 talk about? Jerry, it's your time to shine. It talks about one thing throughout the entire psalm. Psalm 119. What does it talk about? One theme. Okay, Brother Ricky. The word of God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Thy word have I hid in my heart. All of Psalm 119 is designed to teach us about the word of God. All 150 of those verses. But not only that, it also, uh, you know, it teaches us, it teaches us, It exhorts us, Psalm 100, it admonishes. Anyway, praise, prayer, and proclamation. So, every song that we sing at church 
really should fall into one of these categories. They're not neat little categories. Some of them double over into one of others. But that's what singing, that's what Christian singing should involve. Listen, we are not coming together. Funerals get you into a bunch of trouble as a pastor. Uh, let, me, let me tell you my heart, all right? All of y'all, listen, all of y'all are family. And if your family comes to me at a time of a funeral, I'm going to do my best to honor them with a sick stomach. But holes in the floor of heaven and tears falling down is not a Christian song. It's not. Prop me up beside the jukebox. That's pretty simple one, ain't it? All right? Christian music should fall into one of those categories. So practically, here it is. I'm ready, to, I'm ready to teach now. Practically, what does this mean for you and I in the church setting? I've got nine of these, and then I've got five questions to follow up. Number one, music is a gift of God and part of of the created order. Music is a gift of God and part of the created order. In our text that we read uh, in our call to worship, Psalm 96, and also the, the same psalm found in 1, Corinthians, or 1 Chronicles 16, he talks about the sea and all that fill it singing out, the earth and all that fill it singing out, the, the psalmist talks about the heavens declare his glory. Do you remember when Jesus, when, when, when all the Pharisees were complaining about all of that, and Jesus said, listen, if they don't cry out, the very rocks will cry out. Music is a gift of God and part of God's created order. We need to see that. We need to cherish that. God gave us music as a gift. Number two, this goes without saying, but it needs to be said. Number two, there should be singing in Sunday gathering. There should be. One of the biggest challenges of my life uh, was at our former church. We went through a split, and in one Sunday, I lost my song leader, my piano player, my, the guy who run the tape stuff, like, we was left with 20 people, and couldn't none of us sing. And so I came in broken, beaten, and I came to the pulpit, and I said, thank you for showing up. Will you please turn your Bible? And I began to preach. We did that for about three weeks, and finally I had a young man stand up and say, I can do this, preacher. Now, looking back at that time, we, could, we should have done something different, but I didn't know no different. That sounds smart, didn't it? I didn't know no different. There should be singing in Sunday gathering. One of the greatest preachers of history was Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon did not like instruments. He said, oh, I love an organ. An organ is just fine as long as its pipes are filled with cement. I love the guy, but, but he didn't like musical instruments. They would come in, they would sing one song, and he would preach. But even he saw the need for singing. There should be singing in our Sunday gathering. Number three, of all the musical instruments that can be employed in the worship service, in the singing service, the human voice must have priority. Of everything we do, the human voice must have priority. Let me break it down like this. I like drums. Everybody all right with that? Y'all like drums too? Sure. I like drums. I like guitars. I like banjos. I love when Miss Juanita plays the organ. I love the piano. I like all that stuff. The church in which I grew up, 
Man, they got like two pianos, a keyboard, an organ. They got trombones, and they got all of that fancy stuff, you know. They got the whole orchestra. They've got it all. All of that stuff is great. But if that stuff becomes more important than the actual singing, you're missing it. You're missing it. The singing must have Uh, it's it's not a rock concert or we're in the country I don't think we have much of that it's not a country concert it's about our voices being lifted up to God the human voice must have priority congregations number four congregations should learn to sing together Congregations should learn to sing together. Y'all, I came from a context, and Brother Ricky will tell you, of of a a Church of God church hymnal. Stamps Baxter music, four-part harmony. I'm talking my good stuff. Now, a lot of it was doctrinally messed up, but it was good music. We went to, uh, I went with uh, Slim to... Uh, the holiness camp meeting that they were having. And and I knew all the songs because it's what I grew up on. I love that stuff. But you know what I love about that stuff? Is that harmony, that working together, that four different things coming together for one good. They learned. They didn't wake up one Sunday and just everybody was masters at the hymn book. It was work. It took time. Congregations should learn to sing together. Number five, singing singing is a ministry that belongs to all of the people of God. Right now you're thinking, well, singing ain't my gift. Singing may not be your gift, but it's your command. You may have a voice like mine or a voice like Jerry's. Have y'all heard Slim sing? You may sound beautiful like Rachel. You may have a great voice like Sharon or or Gloria. You, You may have a good voice. You may not have a good voice. But listen to me. That is a ministry that belongs to every single one of us. Number six. The church's ministry of singing is for the glory of God. Um, One of the things that I struggle with, I guess Sunday night is a good time for confession. One of the things that, that I struggle with is our ministerial alliance. And when we get together and we talk about community services, and I've told I've told the people who work in the ministerial alliance this, so that's not a surprise. But when we get together and we talk about these community services, and inevitably, the conversation always, always, always leads to, well, you know, used to, we just used to take turns and everybody would sing a song. And, and it, it, in my mind, I struggle because singing a worship service, all of that stuff. I don't care how great you are. It's not about a talent show. It's not about you. It's not about your favorite singer, your favorite song. It's not about us. It's about Him because He's worthy. You're not worthy. He's worthy. You didn't die. He died. You're not great. He's great. That's the point. Singing is for the glory of God. Singing is also for the edification of God's people. And I know I'm running the same tracks, but I want to make this point clear. The church's ministry of singing is for the building up or the edification of God's people. We sing songs. Uh, when, When we ride down the road, 
if, if the radio's playing, I'm absolutely amazed at the amount of songs that James can remember. It blows my mind. He can't remember to wash his clothes. He can't remember to take out the trash. He can't remember to do his chores or his homework. But he knows thousands of songs. Songs that I've never, ever, ever heard. And all of these songs are teaching something. Luke Combs, long neck, uh, long neck beer never broke my heart. Well, oh, thank you for that one, James. And my son, the pastor's son, everybody. Um, it, it, what it's doing is it's teaching through that song that it's no heartache in that. Was well, that true? No, it's not. We talked about this. Alcohol is a sharp-edged knife that if not handled correctly will cut you to pieces. However, our culture is teaching them something. It's easy to pick on rap, but there's enough problems in country music to spend days on. The church's ministry of song is to build up God's people. What we sing should be building up God's people. Number eight. Number eight. Quality is more important than quantity. Quality of music. Now, this isn't necessarily talking about how good you sing. This is the quality of the actual song. So, uh, thank God that Christian writers have found their way back to writing hymns. We went through about a 15 to 20 year writing spree where it was nothing but 7-11 mindless drone songs. Bailey likes to listen to that Oceans and Bethel music and all that other that just mindless stuff. And Browers, man, I tell you, drive me insane. The quality of the song is way more important than the quantity. I would rather you say something good, wholesome, something with some depth, than for five minutes look up into the sky while humming the same three words. Number nine, congregational members should not be, ex not, not be afraid to express their emotions during singing. Let me tell you, there's a great danger in our day. The charismatic movement has um, warped and twisted so many things. emotionalism the pursuit of emotions as if as if the the point of a service is the emotion that you feel that's emotionalism following emotions emotionalism is a sin but emotions are not well, let me say it like this we've looked at crazy people barking like dogs in services. And so we have snatched the wheel the other way. And we said, not us. We Baptists. We first Baptists. We prim. We proper. We ain't going to be barking like no dog. We ain't going to be, we'll be running, acting crazy. We ain't going to be laying out on the floor. We ain't going to be doing none of that. However, what we did is we overcorrected. And we became stoic yes, sir. in our worship. There's times, there's times that I look at Slim and I think, God help, what's wrong with him? There's sometimes in church, I do that all the time, but in church, there's times that I look at him and I think, man, what's wrong with him? And many of y'all do too. Like, was Opal really that mean to him? 
<laughs> however, however, don't miss this. Slim, he don't care who's around. He don't care. He don't care who he's with. He don't care who he's around. Doesn't matter if it's at the diner. Doesn't matter if we go visit another church. Doesn't matter if we go to Hinton to the to the annual uh, meeting, the, the associational meeting. It doesn't matter where we're at or if we're sitting here in Sunday school or up talking to the kids or down at the holiness barn giving his testimony. He don't give a rip. Slim isn't pursuing an emotion. Slim is, pers- I hate using Slim so much, but he, he's, he's a good example this time. He's pursuing Christ and his emotions are trying to catch up. When we sing, um, Connie, Connie, go uh, put uh, to God be the glory. I think it's that second verse. I'm making her do something without telling her I was going to do it ahead of time. So love to the world. Go to the next page. Okay. Now go to the next one. 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 Here it is. Here it is. Oh, perfect redemption. The purchased, uh, the purchase of blood. To every believer, the promise of God. First off, let's stop for a minute. That's beautiful. Now. Now, I don't necessarily understand all of that. That's beautiful. That's a whole lot better than oceans. That's a whole lot better. A whole lot better. However, that's not where that verse ends. Go to the next one. The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Now, let's stop for a minute and let's say thank God. Because you were that vilest offender. You were that one who was headed to hell. You were the wretch, the mean, the ugly, the great sinner. You were that one that stood guilty before a holy God, condemned in your sin, judged already, awaiting the wrath of God. And then God gave you the ability to believe and you believed. And that very moment, he said pardon. You know what pardon is? A, a pardon, you know, we think of it as in, as in some of those cases where, uh, you know, somebody got arrested and we found out 20 years later through DNA that they didn't really, they weren't really guilty. And then so, all right, well, he really wasn't guilty, so we'll issue a pardon. No, 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 no. That wasn't us. No, because we really were guilty. We were the ones that were the bad ones who did the wrong. And God looked at us and said, I know you've done wrong, but you're pardoned anyway. Let me tell you, there's something in that that stirs my heart. It, 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 It drives an emotion. Don't let that scare you. The charismatics are not going to scare me away from the Holy Ghost and emotion. God has been too good, too grand, and too great. He's worth it. So, those are the nine things. I got five questions. All right? We're, We're about to land this plane. These are questions that we should ask about our singing. What theology is expressed in our singing? Or what is actually being said in our singing? One of the things about that Church of God hymn book is there were several songs in there that was very works-based salvation. I'm going to make it to heaven somehow. I keep climbing, I keep working, I keep doing. Now, those songs were very toe-tappish. The 
That sounds like a good word, Ricky. I mean, they caught, they caught your toes. They caught your attention. They, they sounded good. But what were they actually saying? Or, in popular uh, contemporary culture, um, this, this, this song about, um, about uh, is it holy water? Yeah. First off, it sounds good, but what is it teaching? It's teaching that salvation comes through the baptism. There's another one. Now, it's been a few years since it was real popular, but reckless love. Now, reckless means careless. That's literally what the word means. And in describing God's love, is it reckless? As if God doesn't know what he's doing? What are the words? And, and it's easy to pick at contemporary culture. It's easy to do that. However, there are many hymns. So we should always be asking the question, what is actually being taught in our singing? Second question. Are we providing, are we providing a sufficient vocabulary of praise. Are we providing a sufficient vocabulary of praise? Now, remember in John uh, five or six, we'll find it here in six months when I make it that to the next couple of chapters. Um, but God, uh, uh, Jesus heals this blind man. And he goes back to town and he's like, look, I really don't know what happened. All I know is I was blind, but now I see. You remember that story? That is a beautiful picture of us at the time of salvation. You couldn't even spell reconciliation. You didn't know nothing about justification. You couldn't have found a New Testament or an Old Testament. If somebody would have asked you which one was the testaments, you would have been worried you were going to court to testify. You didn't know all of that stuff. And you don't have to know all of it in order to come into Him. The smallest child, this is why Jesus said, let the little children come to me. The smallest child who can understand that they're a sinner and God died for sinners and that if you trust Him, He'll save you. What a beautiful, simple message. However, there's a whole lot more to it. How do we know that stuff? Through singing. We know it from preaching, from Sunday school, and from all the... And you better go home and read your Bible. All of those things, all right? But, But... But how do we learn specifically how to praise him? Brother Ricky and I come from context, and I know y'all think we're crazy. And that's okay, because we is. But we've come from context, context where people say amen, where people say praise the Lord. Where we tell the preacher, hey, you're doing a good job. Why? Wow, he's preaching. you running well. That's all. you standing too close, preacher. That's enough. <laughs> Brother Richard taught me well. <laughs> How did I learn all of that? Through music. Hallelujah. How did I learn to clap my hands? How did I learn to, to raise my hand even when I didn't have a question? Music helps that. And so one of the questions that we have to ask when it comes to singing is are we providing the congregation a sufficient vocabulary of praise? Are they learning it? Number three, this is going to hurt us. Does the music actually serve the text? Does our music actually serve our text. Wow. 
what we sing and, and, and how we sing and all of that stuff should flow from Scripture. Months back, David and I had a conversation. Um, and every time that I think I'm going to slow down long enough to meet with David, it doesn't happen. I blame all of y'all. Um, but we, we had a conversation a while back about not just, and, and this applies not simply to uh, our hymns. Our hymns, that hymn book should flow from the Bible. It should. But in a worship service setting, our singing should flow from the text we're dealing with. You ever been to, been to church and it been like two services? I mean, nothing fit together, nothing, nothing. It's okay to say amen, you know. You have, you have some singing, and you're like, yeah, that's good. And then you hear some preaching, and, and you're like, well, they're both good, but they didn't have nothing to do with each other. That's not how they done it in Scripture. Stop. That, that's not how they done it in Scripture. Or what we sing should actually flow from the text. Number four. Does our music... Encourage corporate worship. Does our music encourage corporate worship? Why do we gather together? To what, Slim? Praise the Lord. To praise the Lord, all right? We, we, we gather together to praise the Lord. We gather together to hold a worship service. Does what we sing actually encourage worship? Or does it make us think about mama? I love my mama. I do. We're going to pack her up on a plane hopefully soon and, move and, and bring her out here for a weekend. I love my mama. But when I come to church, I don't want to think about mama. Number five. Does what we sing encourage growth in fellow believers? Does what we sing encourage? If we are commanded to encourage one another and all of that stuff, is what we, is, is what we are actually singing doing what we are commanded to do? Now, if... Our singing doesn't line up with the, the pattern of Colossians 3, with the pattern of Ephesians 5, or even the, the, the pattern of the book of Psalms. I think in, in early 2000, there was a survey or, or a study done of 150 uh, contemporary songs. And in that 150 contemporary songs, 71% of them, 71% dealt with the personal feelings of the believer and never regarded God. Think about that for a minute. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not much of an early 2000s contemporary listen because I, contemporary music listener because I thought it was all garbage. However, you know what I did grow up listening to? Songs. I did listen to songs. Thank you, James. I grew up listening to Southern Gospel. I know I'm talking about y'all sacred cow, all right? But I grew up listening to Southern Gospel. And so much of Southern Gospel spent so much time talking about personal feelings with no regard to God. It was sad. Music today, and I, and I said this a couple of weeks ago, if you replaced Jesus with Bailey, you would think it was a love song. Oh, Bailey, I love you. Bailey, Bailey, you're the fairest one ever. Bailey, Bailey, I love you so much. Bailey, you're the best. There's no substance. The vilest offender, David, 
good pick tonight. The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. There's weight to that. So putting it simply, what is singing? Singing is telling the book with melody. For the Christian, singing is telling the book with melody. I think, well, David, come, come back here. Let's sing this to God be the glory. Just because y'all did such a good, on, a good job on it the first time. It's going to take David 10 minutes to get up here. I can make 12 announcements.